sign shift to the opposite side. That means if the C0, which is the occiput, is in this function in side shift to the left, you will have the right ear down compared to the left. So after that, my patient will give you an answer if there is C0 dysfunction or not. Right? Okay. You will find if there is any movement of the sacrum in the front or in the back, or you will see if there is any positioning of the PSIS there down or up, and you will find any, when you will palpate, you will find if there is any inflammation, because there is a lot of ligaments. I don't know if you remember the structure of that location, but there is a lot of layers of ligaments, at least three layers of ligaments, sacral ear layers of ligaments there, plus the iliolumbar uh, ligaments. So that, that location, we saw that already it's very stable. So if there is any uh, dysfunction between the ileum and the sacrum, you will find it with hypersensitivity. When you press on that location, the patient will react immediately, right? Mm -hmm. and yes, there is. Yes. There is hyperextension here. So there is almost like a recurvatum mm -hmm. into the knee a little bit. You can see the quad over there. And then the ischio, the armstring over there, in a different way. Yes. So is it uh, about the, the way it puts some weight on the feet? Is it more in the posterior attitude or it's more an anterior attitude? Posterior. You say, who say post? Results. Posterior attitude? Yeah, and who say anterior attitude? Well, I guess, that, what about the others? <laughs> there is, a, there is a, another attitude? And so, immediately in your clinical reasoning, you have to make the link between the foot, the knee, the hip, the trunk, and the head. If I'm more in the back position, what's going to happen with my muscle in the front? They are trying to pull me back to the front, is it? So, I will probably find some spasm into tibialis anterior, I will probably find something into the quad. And regarding the structure with the connecting uh, muscles, I will find something in the front resisting to the back issue, right? The thumb will be <coughs> on the uh, mandible, the horizontal branch of the mandible. Not the vertical branch, but the horizontal branch. So my thumb will follow the direction of the mandible also, right? So here, you get a good contact point with the MP joint there. And then here, with a chin hold, and then I will pull up to make a gap between C0 and C1 on the right side. And you get a chance to increase the space between the two pieces and then move my uh, C0 left to the right. So here, you have to introduce, before to press, you have to introduce a mild testing to evaluate capacity of the bone to move to the opposite side. Or if there is too much resistance, you will be the one to say, okay, I will maybe do another technique, maybe MET or something, to make that one more comfortable for the patient. Because if you do something like against a wall of resistance, you you should be very, very specific, or at least you will, you will harm the patient, right? So make sure that as soon as you decided to go through an HVT technique, that you have a maximum chance of uh, About my contact points, myself, against the table, don't be away from the table. Make sure that you have contact points with your own body around the table. Here, my thigh, my two thighs are against the table to make my body stay. And Again, my contact point with my elbow against my side, my waist over there to 
assume the good direction there, right? And then after that, I will play with the tissue and try to follow kind of a pathway to make the regulation between the two pieces. So there is not one direction, it depends on your patient. And you have to follow and you have to find out the, the best one for him or her, okay? You have to remember how it works for the pelvis. First, three bones, sacrum, iliums are connected with ASI joint, right? The two iliums are connected also in the front with the pubic joint. So there is three joints on the pelvic unit, two in the back, one in the front. I'm not talking about the sacrum occipital. I'm talking about these main ones between the sacrum and the ilium and the ilium in between in the
you need to put the leg over the other one. In that way, you put the hand the ilium already posteriorly. If you put. But sometimes people don't do that. But at the very beginning, I guess it would be helpful if you can add some help from the patient itself with that position of the leg. So again, you can start from here. Put that one over this one. Make the ilium pre-positioning into posterior here. Then move to the top of the model. Get rotation there. First, get a good contact point with your forearm behind. Get a contact point with your elbow here. Move the patient outside the table, and then we move back to the table. Keep your contact point with your elbow on the elbow of the model. Get your hand over there. Introduce rotation, and then you press. And then yourself, you put the model back to the supine position and release. Is that okay? The yes. action. Uh, some details about your test. Yesterday we did already in standing position for the ilium, in sitting position for the sacrum. We did also um, the downing test to check if there is any posterior or anterior dysfunction with the ilium with the discrepancy on the legs. We did also the pubic evaluation. So with these one, two, three, four evaluation, normally it's supposed to be at least uh, give you some idea about any dysfunction. If it's not clear, like it could happen sometime with some patient for any reason, you need to go to through uh, more uh, detailed analysis. So, basically, if you have enough information to say, okay, this is that dysfunction, so go through the treatment. If you don't have enough information, and if it's not clear, two options. Maybe you there is a lack of information from your side, so you need to go through more detailed information, or maybe you don't need to treat the pelvis because this is accommodation, like I said previously, and you don't need to touch that one. If the patient is working like this, if there is any pain which is a signal, it will be probably a referred pain in that case, and you have to look forward to any other cause, like maybe a T12, L1 dysfunction, or maybe a hip dysfunction, or, you know, but not specifically the ASI joint or the pubic joint function in that case. So, but if it's not enough, again, go to more detail with evaluation for the muscle, go to more detail with other body units, hips, lumbers, lumbar sacral junction, or sometimes also uh, thoracolumbar junction. So open the space a little bit more then see if you can have more detail to understand what's happened locally on the ASI joint or on the pubic joint. Is that okay? Your model will be on sideline position. <coughs> the dysfunction is a posterior dysfunction for the ilium. So the meaning for us is to move back the ilium into the right position. So we don't need that time to introduce rotation from the top. There is no rotation there. The uh, the model stay in sideline position strictly. There is no rotation. But there is compression force. There is a compression force with your hand over the shoulder of the model to make the leverage here compact, right? So a good contact point here with your hand over the shoulder of the model. Still the same with your feet on the ground. Take a good stance on the ground and bend your knees and face the model. Don't be like this in that case. Face the model. So bend your knees. <coughs> Get a good contact point on the shoulder. And here, above that contact point on the ilium, you will go through the iliac crest with your elbow. The fleshy part of your <coughs> elbow will be on the ilium here externally for the iliac crest, right? So compression force here from up to down, but no rotation, just compression. You make that level here compact, right? 
So here, with your, your forearm over the ilium, here with your hand over the shoulder, and then you're going to move the pelvis in 45 degrees down to the table. Previously, legs, knee flex at 90 degrees, hips flex at 45 degrees, and then pelvic move down to 45 degrees regarding the table. And then, here, the thrust will be moving down your hand towards the ground, down the table over there. So here, the thrust will be this, moving your the ilium into anterior position. That's the movement here. We move anteriorly the ilium, right? Okay, I'm going to show you. So here, same process, but instead of moving your forearm <coughs> directly to the front, you will move your elbow backward. So here, you check with your hand over there. You put your elbow not on the shoulder, but here on the pectoralis major, which limits any impact on the shoulder. Like this, right? So here you move down the pelvis still, and then you will trust. I, that one is, um, I guess, for the beginners, the other one is a little bit more technical, but it's easier into the first. That one, you need to be a little bit more uh, into uh, restraint if you don't have the good leverage. But, there is a lot of techniques again. I choose almost 50 of these ones, but I can demonstrate some kind of other version. It is a bit technical into positioning again, but in terms of efficiency, it's a good one. And you can apply that one over the whole age, to the for average age, like 40 to more elderly people also. So first of all, you will flex the knee of the model over there. And then you will cross the leg like this. Then here you bend your knees and the meaning are we are gonna sorry, we're gonna treat uh, that one, the anterior dysfunctions on the left side. So here I'm gonna move the knee first and the pelvis like this. It's a combined motion over there. So you get a good contact point on the side here. You get a good contact point with the feet on over your biceps. And then from here, you get a good contact point also with your knee against the table. And then you will, you will press over there and then that. So from that position here, you will ask the model to get that arm along the table. Yes. And then, Turn your head uh, from the left. So from that positioning here, get the knees of the model between your thighs. Get a good contact point first at the very beginning here with the hand over the shoulder blade. And then here, get a good contact point in the circus on the left side, here. So at the very beginning of the technique, you will ask the model to breathe in and breathe out, and during the breath out, you will move down the shoulder with your hand, pressing here to introduce some distraction force. Okay? So breathe in and breathe out. And you move down, you press down here to introduce distraction force. Okay? One more time. And then you're going to work on back to your model, changing your position with your hands, and then here, 
get the get the knee between your thigh and move the leg outside the table. So I'm gonna ask after moving down the legs here to the model, I'm gonna ask the model to press up. Lift up. So lift up your yeah, that's it. So counter resistance, 10 seconds. And then release, three seconds. And then again, 10 seconds, no, no. And then 10 seconds, I'm gonna move down the legs to make the base of the sacrum on the left side moving backward. You're gonna feel that. When you press down with your hand here on the feet of the model, you will feel the space between your fingers tip and the base of the sacrum on the left side moving backward, okay? So here again, First, I'm moving down the legs passively until the bind, the, bar the barrier here, that's it. That means the barrier, that means if I'm moving down the legs, I will introduce also the body, the whole body. I want to be very specific till the limit <coughs> of the base of the sacrum. I don't want to engage the lumbar or anything else. No, I want to be specific on that segment, right? So here I'm moving down to the barrier. And then, about the positioning of your forearm over there, don't stay like this. Move your forearm down with your elbow, like this. That way you can have a good contact point to press down. Not using your shoulder, but using the whole body. So here, I'm moving down. I ask the model to push up. That's it, counter resistance. So about Pushing up, it's not like uh, we are doing like a fight. No, it's only 20% of the maximum of the force. In that muscle energy technique, 20%, <coughs> no more. Sometimes you can see patients that are, oh, no, relax, only 20%. What means 20%? That means it's a, a, a just a mind effort. Take it easy, right? So here, okay, so push up, counter resistance, 10 seconds. Then release. I'm increasing down there, three seconds. Then release. And then again and again and again. Almost time, three times, you repeat the action. First, positioning, then counter resistant action, then releasing, three seconds, and then lengthening, 10 seconds. And then again, counter resistant. Release three seconds, and then gain into the new barrier, 10 seconds. So, to finish the technique, you passively... No, 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 don't do anything. So you will take the feet that way, you will put your hand over there, and then you will gently rotate from that position here, you gently rotate, and then move down, and release. And then you check, of course, after the technique, if the second is Back in the new position. Okay? Alright, action. My fingers are running down beside the spine, fingertips. Most of the time I'm using two, uh, three and four. And then I'm here, and then I'm doing like this. So it's a positional uh, finding. We, we, we do already the assessment before, but and when I do that like this, it's a positional finding. If I do that here, I can find it already. Right? So the same. A little bit down there, yes, it's T7 here, so it's T5, T6, T7 on the left side, there is something wrong, right? Okay, on your back. <coughs> so, there is different option. There is that one, in terms of positioning for the arm of the model, or there is that one with the hands interlock, fingers interlock behind head and neck. So we will start with that one. Move your hands a little bit up. That's it. <clears throat> so here you will ask the mother to make the elbow close and then you will compress over there. So it's easy to move into flexion the upper ones, right? From that position here first, you get your contact point. With my thinner eminence, 
on the posteriority with my fingers flexed to the other side and my thumb is on line with the uh, align with the spine okay so the spinous process is in between my fingers and my thinner eminence and the process the transverse process are transversely aligned there so there is two options the vertebrae is in extension no shoot, don't shoot me pose your phone the vertebrae is in extension or the vertebrae is in flexion, <coughs> right? I mean, at least the basic one. So, normally into neutral position, they are more into flexion, but in terms of this function, it could be into extension, of course, or into more flexion. So, regarding your applying force, if the vertebrae is into a dysfunction of flexion, that means we are here, that one is the, the one you target, and that one is into that position. To your understanding where, in which direction will be my pressure? Is it more towards the head or more towards the foot? Head. Head. I will press like this to put it into extension, right? And if it's like this, it will be more like I will press towards the feet and then to make the vertebrae like this. So basically, it's the two way to interfere with this function into flexion or extension. If you have additional like a side bending and rotation, you will have to play with your wrist. If there is side bending, you will try to compensate with your wrist into the opposite direction. But at the moment, I stay very basic for flexion and extension, right? So flexion, you are pushing directing to the head, extension you will push in direction to the feet, right? Okay. So here, take your model, again, <coughs> get your contact point, and move back your model on your head. Then here, move your belly over the elbow, avoid to get the elbow directly against your belly. You will suffering for nothing. So you're pressing down over there and then you're moving up that Stop. way. Yeah. And then you introduce here a bit of traction. Here, that way. Okay? So here I'm start to pull up the lower one, the upper one, and then I'm pushing down with my stomach here. Alright? And then I will move down gently here, and then when I'm focused on, when my pressure is focused on above the dysfunction here, I will press. So you need to play with your model, try to see if you're just above the dysfunction, and then you adjust, am I pushing down there, or am I pushing up there regarding the dysfunction? And then gently drop down, bend your knees, let your move your weight moving down to the patient. Uh, the other one is uh, that one. So that one you're gonna play also with the elbows. If you move the elbows up, what's gonna happen? Extension. 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 If you move the the elbows down more into flexion. So it's up to you to choose the way you are pushing up or down. Right? So here, again, you give me your head. So for all thoracic spine, like from D1 to D12? To D1 to D1 to D1 in that position? The same concept? Mm, uh, in terms of position? <coughs> or? In terms of position? No. Because orientation is different. No. It will, so that one, I will say that for these two ones, you can focus till like uh, T7, yes, T6, T6, T7. If I have to uh, move down to T8 to T12, I will probably start in a sitting position, like a modified dog technique. Or I will do that in a sitting position with direct contact on the posterity with my hand, 
like longer. So depends on the on the level of the dysfunction, but most of the time between T1 and T3, which is uh, tough to get the a normalization there, I could use I could use also yes sitting position, which is easiest for me. Uh, I can use also in supine position. I can use also like a cervical uh, methodology, or in prone position. I can use also the one like the C7, C1, C1, C1. C1. So depending again uh, of the level. Uh, so that one like this. So <clears throat> here, contact point. Moving there. I can play here, so I, I'm not taking a lever here, leverage here by the top. I will play here with the level. That's the way I'm positioning my hand. If I'm doing like this, my shoulder is not a good uh, position. If I'm doing like this, I'm more comfortable. So it will help to you to choose like this, or like this, or like this. But by the way, the meaning is to focus on again your technique so focus on the level and then first right <coughs> this you okay still alive yes so if a uh, spine is <coughs> gone anteriorly slightly flexion. Into, into flexion yeah. so we can treat it either in the flexion position or in the extension position the same vertebra yes so that's what we're doing there are two methods of treating the same problem that the meaning if is there the you will have the same position for two different problems, but the orientation of your applying force will be different. Either the head, either the feet. But the, the position will be the same. Just your applying force will be different, of course. It should be. Uh, prone position, please. Uh, it's, it's, it's. <coughs> We are looking for cervicothoracic dysfunction, okay? So cervicothoracic dysfunction could be C7, could be T1, uh, it could be uh, T2. So the process is almost the same. We will here focus, so wait for a while, sorry. It should be flat. <coughs> so here we will ask the model to start in a neutral position. Then we will take the landmark with C71, whatever. And then, if it's a dysfunction into left rotation, my, I will be on the left side of the model. If it's the right one, I will be to the other side. So, if it's a left rotation, the meaning is that the spinous process is deviated to the right side, right? Okay. So, I will have a contact point with my thumb on the lateral part of the transverse process, of the spinous process here on the right side, okay? Let's see like this. And then I will ask my model to go to a chin position to get a bit of extension. So move to, yes, like this. So move down a little bit. That's it. Most of the time I ask my model to release the arms like this. That way there is a natural traction down there at the level of the C7. I will put my thumb on the lateral, so before you put your thumb, you decline, recline the soft tissue here. That means you take off the slack over there. That means any elasticity, any soft tissue between your hand <coughs> and the uh, thoracic or the cervical one here. So here I recline the, the tissue and then I will press here on the lateral part of the spinous process. Okay? On that technique, you should be very close, I mean over your patient. It's one of the closest one into HVT practice. So here, first, I will introduce a lateral side bending. Don't, don't do anything. I will introduce a side bending there, gently, till I feel into my finger a barrier, that means a restriction of mobility. Remember, the, <coughs> the <coughs> vertebra is rotated to the right side. So the meaning is that the left rotation is restricted. So if you turn like this, it 
to be maybe not so comfortable for your patient. So we'll go like this and then your elbow will naturally go down to be at the same level of your hand. That's the reason you have to be very close because you need to put your elbow at the same level, right? So here I introduce a bit of rotation and in the meantime I press up to give some room over Absolutely. there between the two uh, vertebrae. So here, pressing with my thumb against the <laughs> spinous process, introducing a bit of rotation and then thrust for uh, a dysfunction with the first rib. That rib could be sometime in an up position. That means an up position, that means there will be effect, side effect with the brachial plexus because the space between the clavicle and the first rib is not so big. So if the first rib is up, there is possibly with the, the pectoralis minor also, uh, possibly entrapment for the brachial plexus. So you need to move down that way to make things better with any more numbness and anything into the arm. How okay? will we assess? Again? How will we assess? The first rib? Yeah. Ask your mother to breathing in and breathing out. So if the ribs are in the normal function, when the ribs are moving into breathing in, it's moved like this. And when the ribs are moving into breathing out, it comes down, all right? If there is any dysfunction into up position, when you will ask the model to breathing in, normal, nothing will happen. And when you will ask the model to breathing out, that one will be up. So here, positioning for the practitioner here, you are with your knee flexed to the opposite side of the uh, dysfunction. Contact point in the front on the forehead here. Then the contact point here with the MCP is above the first rib. Metacarpophalangeal above the first rib. So the first rib is remember the, the, the shape of the first rib. She is first she is almost like a more in a horizontal plane. She is shorter than the other ones and she is wider than the other ones. So you can easily recognize the first one. Okay. Here. About the orientation of my thrust, it will be to the opposite side here of the model. Okay, so I will press down there obliquely to the opposite side, the breast, right? So my contact point is not here, it's more in the front here. That way I can control the head. Okay. So I introduce. Do you have any issue with your leg? Any whiplash? Uh, no, no, no. Accident? No, there is no, no problem with your leg. No, no. Blood pressure is okay. Yeah, it is. How much? It's nine. It's hundred and ten by ninety. Hundred and ten by sorry, eighty. The last one was. Hundred and ten by eighty. The last one you take it. It was. The last night. Last night. Yeah. Hundred and ten. Hundred and ten by. Your French said that you're not so good. Is that the reason you take your blood pressure? No, no, I was taking the blood pressure of my in-law, so I just took it for myself. Yeah, okay. So here. Side bending, introducing side bending with my knee on the right side, and open the space here, gently. So you can see the head, look at the head. When I'm opening my knee, whoops, the head is moving in side bending left, right? And then I will introduce a bit of rotation to the opposite side to increase the pressure under the first rib. And here I will introduce my thrust again the direction to the opposite side. That means from left to right. Okay? So here I will do thrust like this. That one will be a lift technique which is more global technique, less specific one. So you will, again, choose the level of C71 or T2. I will go more like T1, T2 level, okay? About your contact point over there, sorry. You will put only one contact point with the chest. 
could be the right one or the left one, but only one pectoral is contact here over the, the vertebrae. So here I will move down and press over there to get a stabilization of the level below the one I want to move up. Then I will go here and do like a double Nelson um, technique and then I will put my knee on the table there. So contact point with my chest over the vertebrae at the level below T2 because I'm going to move T2 and then I will ask my model to contraction there, move the elbow to the front, that's it. And then I will ask her to move the head into extension a little bit, till my level, that's it. And then from here, I will start to play with the spine, compression force here into extension or flexion, keep your traction there, your elbow, close your elbow. Take your elbow, yeah, that's it. And then from here, I will lift up. About the cervical spine, we need to consider one or two features which are different from the other segments. First, that segment of seven cervical vertebrae is not included into the trunk. It's out of the trunk, which is a main difference between the cervical and the other one. The difference into what? Into <coughs> stability. The muscle around the neck will be very active to make that segment protect and to make that segment effective into motion. So that's the first one we have to consider. That segment is out of the trunk. About the curvature on the cervical spine, it's a low dosis normally, but you will have also sometimes straight neck, stiff neck, and you will see on the uh, x-rays that there is no more curvature. The cervical spine is almost straight, which is a bit complicated biomechanically because the rotation, the side bending, and other component of mobility will be changed also. So you have to deal with that. So if in your with your patient, you have any stiffness, chronic stiffness or something, you probably will ask an uh, x-ray examination to see if there is no modification on the cervical spine itself. If there is one, you need to reconsider your bi biomechanic approach on that segment. That segment is made with two parts, the upper one, the lower one. The upper one we included here, the occiput, I call it C0. Not only me, you will see that on books, C0, it's very common to talk about the occiput. And by the way, in terms of embryogenesis, the occiput, we can consider the occiput like the first cervical vertebra, initially. So, C0, C1, C2 is the upper segment and then the lower segment will be from C3 to C7. So biomechanically it makes sense because we don't have any intervertebral disc between C0 and C1, C1 and C2. Like I said before, it's a particular uh, relationship with ligaments 
uh, and suboccipital muscle to make that part uh, easy to move more into rotation than the other ones, but also that part stable uh, in a different way that with a disc uh, in between the body of the vertebrae. Another particularity of that full segment is the vertebral artery. That vertebral artery, again, is one of the arteries coming from the subclavian artery, which is one of the subdivisions here from this trunk over there. So, coming from the subclavian artery, that one is coming up from C6 to C1. C7 is not included into the pathway of that artery. So you can HVT7, uh, C7 without uh, any risk on that artery. But from C6 to C1, yes, you have to pay attention and particularly on the upper ones, which is C1 and C2, you have to pay attention to that artery and we will see uh, a, like a, a test, initial test, before we do any adjustment on that segment. Uh, still into the biomechanics and any impact of traumatic issue on the cervical spine, classically, when we have a car accident, the pathway to the dysfunction into the cervical spine is hyperextension first and then hyperflexion after, which is a whiplash injury. In that case, first you damage the soft tissue, the deep soft tissue, the membrane and the, syst the ligamentous system close to the vertebrae. And then reacting to this, the muscle can react with stiffness and tightness and spasm. But in that case, with whiplash injury, you also have to think about the upper segment, which is C0, C1, C2, and you have to think about the positioning of C2 with the dance. If in that injury, the position of C2 has changed, yes or not. Because if the position of C2 changed, the position of C1 will change also. So you will have a right dysfunction here between C1 and C2. And if you have a dysfunction between C1 and C2, you will include C0 also. So this a particular complex, C0, C1, C2, you have to pay attention when you start to do your technique for any HVT technique or your assessment on that block. When it uh, comes for a torticoli, which is a acute spasm, muscle spasm on neck, if you have patient with that condition, you observe already that they are restricted into all range of motion. They can do rotation, they can do flexion, they are very, very limited. It's very painful, they are very limited. So to do an HVT technique on that kind of condition, you should be very experienced to avoid any side effect and any uh, counter resistance from your patient. So I will recommend for that particular condition, the torticoli, to avoid in first intention any HVT technique. You be more uh, advised to go to soft tissue technique, soft tissue release, passive mobilization, and then finally HVT technique. Um, if there is any abnormality into the curvature, like we talked before with a straight neck, <coughs> you have to reconsider your testing evaluation also. It could be also in, uh, into increased uh, curvature, like hyperflexion. When I say flexion, it's uh, in the frigate low, so I should say hyperextension for you. But the curve is regarding behind, so the arc between the two extremities is shorter. So into hyperextension, people like uh, some trouble with the vision, 
people with some trouble with uh, kyphosis, they will be hyper in hyper extension to accommodate with the vision sometimes. So you also have to pay attention if you want to do any technique on that kind of hyper extended segment, you will probably be advised to work first on the other unit, which is for the cervical spike below the thoracic unit. Of course, any traumatic issue should be uh, for you a warning, thinking about any fracture on the, on the cervical spine, so you have to pay attention to that. And coming from the cervical, commonly there is an issue with the upper limb uh, or sometimes with the back muscle also due to the uh, brachial plexus down there or common uh, issue with the head with the upper ones between C1 and C2, C2 and C3 with symptomatic issue on the head, headache, migraine, dizziness, um, uh, jaw pain, uh, TMJ issue, um, arm nerve, uh, headache, this kind of condition also. So, be advised to pay attention to these nerves when you do the testing. You can test the reflex for C5, you can test the reflex for C7, and this kind of evaluation before you do any adjustment on spine, if there is any compression or any nerve disorder into the upper limb. Do injury with your neck? Injury? Do you have any background of injury with your neck? Car accident, falls, uh, this kind of... When? 2017. Again? Two years, two years back. Two years two back. Year, what kind of accident? So multiple fractures. Multiple fractures. Hmm? Multiple fractures. Where? In shoulder, in wrist. Mm. Oh. And the neck had uh, nothing? Neck pain. Uh, neck after 15 days. He is diabetic and hypertensive as well. You also hypertensive? Yes. You have a um, treatment uh, medication also? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, today it will not the day. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Hypertension. Like you say, like you know, sorry, damage the intima of the vessels. The, the, the intima become more and more resistant. And then that's the reason there is more and more pressure inside the system. There is less flexibility of the vessel. They become more and more resistant, like arteriosclerosis. And then for the high blood pressure, we, we consider that it could be... Uh, it could be a risk uh, for the practitioner if the patient is not under medication to control the level of the, the blood pressure. If, it's, if there is a maintenance for that high blood pressure and the level is okay, there is no problem. But we, you can have multi-component uh, uh, technique also for HVT on the cervical spine. I'm going to show you right now. If I choose another another level, let's say here on C5 left. So if I want to have impact on that level, but indirectly, my application force will be to the opposite side. What's happened there? It's into a locked position, not only into rotation with the posterior position, but also with a side bending and probably extension uh, dysfunction. So I will be the one to open the space between the articular surface to the opposite side. I will open the space and then I will modify with my component the restriction of mobility to get into more free mobility. So then I will move to flexion till my level C5 on the left. Then I will move to side bending till my level of C5 on the left. Okay. Then I will move to uh, uh, rotation here to the left to my level of C5 to the left. And then I will change my hold here. I will do with my thumb a counter resistant over there, and then with my medias, I will palpate over there. And then here, in that position, 
I will get a contact here with my forearm and my hand and then the truss will be here like this so here I'm introducing a bit of rotation but a minimal because I combine already extension side bending rotation so it will be a minimal rotation we avoid rotation because of the artevan that right here that's the reason we do more like into side or into uh, detranslation of this kind of thing. less into rotation, pure rotation. We don't have not so much pure rotation technique for the HVT on the cervical spine. In that case, each time your patient will complain of with the same localization. It will be almost the same each time. They will not the one to say I have headache around then and then the next time here and then the next time no. They will show you regularly almost the same location for each time. That means the etiology is at one level, same level. So there is no movement. The dysfunction is located at one level. And it reproduces that refer pain on the dermatome to that level. That's it. And then just very last one for the thoracolumbar junction to make sure that upper and uh, lower is almost connected. So the sitting position is like this. Put your feet together on the table. Yes, release your head. So it's a bit kind of thing, isn't it? T12. And release. Okay, so now I'm done. I'm done with my assessment and treatment for him for that. At the way, here it's not a sciatica, it was like more like a lumbar disorder, but I show you almost the same protocol with the sciatica. Okay? Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. You ask your mother to open the mouth and you will see if there is any restriction in opening. Normally, the normal, the normal opening is three fingers into the mouth. It should be normal for everyone. But sometimes, for any reason, you have some restriction in opening, and then, when they say three, not four. So, sometimes it could be any restriction, and then patient will be in pain to open more than normal. Um, so, First, have a look on that opening level, and then see if there is any deviation with the chin from one side where there are problems in the mouth. And that will lead you to one or the other one to treat this one, not only that one, of course. You also can check the occlusion, ask your mother to uh, keep the teeth in uh, contact, and you will see if the mid incisive line here is in the middle with the other one with them there. Or if there is any torsion or any deviation, which means that the mandible is not online. Okay? At least that, that's the minimal requirement. And then you will uh, be able here to take your landmark on the GNJ. Then press with your medius and have a look on your medius from above and you will see if there is one more in the front, one more in the back, not one more up or one more down. So if you have a mirror you can see if there is any one more up and down, but at least from above you can see if there is one in the front and one in the side, which is the sagittal division. So here we use palpation. You also can palpate externally asking the mother to grind the teeth, that's it, and then you can see if there is one more 
Most of the time we are eating from one side. Here, just the contact on the mind, contact on to feel any distraction force on the other side. And then I will pull, I will pull the jaw to the other side to open the space over there and see if there is any retraction, tenderness. Because at the time here, there is a delay for opening the side, <laughs> left side. So you lock the position of the head with your pectoralis, and then here you pull, change, mount, stretching the ligament system. The mouth uh, is in a releasing position, which means the mouth is closed, but the teeth are not in contact. This is the releasing position. If you have that position, your teeth won't be in contact. If you if your teeth are in contact, that means there is a disorder into occlusion already. So you, at that time, you evaluate the resisting force to your traction. If there is more resisting force to one side or to the other, that means there is a locking uh, issue from one side because the other one, plus that one, plus that one, plus the palpation of the clavicle. So you can assess roughly without too much knowledge uh, on the TMG or orthodontics. You can assess minimally at least the ligamentous system on the TMG and the <coughs> muscle system on the TMG. Don't forget the temporalis muscle, it's very thin, very flat, and it's moving down to the fossa, uh, infra temporal fossa over there, behind the digamonti. Zygomatic. Zygomatic. Behind the zygomatic bone, arch over there, between the mother and the temporal, these two ones. You can palpate the joint over there. Just give a nice friction and you will see the suture between the two bones. almost one finger away from the here, external here. Here I'm on the junction between the two. So perfect, the temporalis muscle is coming from down there and then moving up, spreading that one. Sometimes people can complain about unilateral cephalae, headache. So you have to think about the TMJ also with the temporalis and the superficial fascia of the cranium. There is a traction there because of the pulling down in the changes. We can complain about that. So to test the muscle, you can do a nice friction and see if there is any restriction. You can ask the mother to, again, prime the teeth and you will feel the temporary muscle acting there. Again. on the left side. And then, of course, you will check C0, C1, C2, cervical each time. These three ones, C0, C1, C2, are included into the system. We'll change it. Okay? Here, with your biceps for the forehead, with your hand for the occipit. All right? Then, about the cervicothoracic junction over there, you will have your thumb Choose your level. So it's the same process than the other ones. That means when I will introduce side bending and rotation, I will include the vertebra I need to uh, correct. Is it? And I will fix the lower one, that means T1 or T2, fixed behind with my thumb. So it will be like this, side bending, and then I will just like this. And we'll fix the lower one. Exactly. Yes, we fix the lower one like we do for the lumbar. The dysfunction is C7, we'll fix the T1. Exactly. So, first you de low dose the cervical spine, moving the head backward. So, from that now, normal position, you will push forward to move the head and then reduce the low doses. Okay. 
So doing here that way. You deload those the cervical spine. Okay? Here. And then you introduce side bending here. Then you introduce rotation, rotation here and then thrust. Then I will put my elbow here against my knee and then I will be able to get a good contact point here behind the joint in front of the joint. So we contact here the neck of the talus, that means we are under the tibia and here we are above the calcaneus. So we use the thumb and the index, both sides, L-shaped. And then from that position here, we will get a contact point with the elbow on the table and then we will move the leg outside the table to be able to move the foot down there. The meaning is, as soon as I have a contact point here, which is not movable, and I try to move the ankle distally, I will distract the jump, just mechanically. If I do this one here, like this, you see, the leg is moving here. I can do things properly. But if I'm locking the leg here, plus my elbow here, nothing is moving more. And then I can distract here the joint and move the joint into open position. So that one is not the first position at all. That one is the distraction one, to give more space to the talus under the tibia and to play a little bit with the joint to align that joint. So again, about your positioning with your hand, the supporting hand with the calcaneus, with the thumb under the medial malleolus, with the index with the outside the malleolus there, and then the other hand above, on the neck of the talus, you're supposed to keep the foot in neutral position. Don't put the foot in plantar flexion or too much dorsiflexion. No, it's a neutral position which is more close to the dorsiflexion. And then here, gently, you will apply a distraction force, moving the foot forward and downward. Okay? That one. It's a little bit uh, tight, isn't it? That one is the trust. And here the navic, the cuboid behind the base of the fifth metatarsal over there. So this is the your second landmark. So, the meaning here is to use with your body weight first. Don't use your arms, no. Use your body weight, it's enough. And the meaning is to reduce the dysfunction down there. So here, we track and move down the hand like this to reduce the dysfunction, the upper dysfunction, and then we track to the pelocarate in the meantime. So here, again, and then, you can see that? You can feel it? <laughs> you can feel it. Three step. First, here, you get a good contact point with the calcaneus over there, and then you will contact the articular line over there, here, to feel here. Yeah, it's, it's sensitive most of the time because of the ligament, because of the calcaneus. So, from that position here, what's the point? The meniscus at that time here is locked into the two bones. So you need to open the space and then offer a chance to the medial meniscus to move back to the initial position. So it's more like a 
minimal traumatic issue for the meniscus is pinched into the between the two bones. So you need to get a chance to open the joint, distraction, and then move the joint and gapping the joint at the end and moving the meniscus back to the neutral position. So here you need to open the space moving the leg into a B D. Yeah. That one. So you move into A B D and then you start to move down. And then for that position of the foot rotated externally, you will move the foot internally at the end of the technique to re install the internal rotation with the tibia and move back the meniscus down there. So it's like this, <coughs> gapping here, still gapping there, and then when you arrive close to the table there, you're supposed to move the tibia into internal rotation and still stay in touch with the leg. It will be like this.